Hi everybody, this is just a, going to be a tiny, short, little online lecture uh, that I'm going to try to do for each of the topics that we cover during the assessment part to share some background information that you should have already received um, in your undergraduate or post -bac program, or maybe you didn't, but this is some background information that we can cover this way so that when you come into class we can get more down to how it is that you're going to measure the things that you need to measure. And so in this case, what we're going to be talking about is some information, just very quickly, about semantics. And one of the first things that I want to remind everyone about that I know you don't need reminding about is that, indeed, nothing happens in a vacuum, and that's the case with semantics. And so when we think about semantics or word knowledge or the lexicon, those are all different ways that we can refer to it, what we have to recognize is that it's just not about the word. There are other things that connect to the word. So for example, morphology is very closely related to semantics. So the meaning of a word changes sometimes, depending on the morpheme, if it's derivational, depending upon the morpheme that is attached to the word. So it can actually change the part of speech of the word. So we need to be aware of that. The other thing that happens is that we don't say words in isolation. We say words together. So words are, are connected with other words. And that's something that we have to keep in mind when we think about semantics. Because again, it's not about the individual words. It's about how it fits within the sentence, for example. Sometimes when we're going to refer to semantics uh, and what it is that we're going to be targeting, we'll be thinking about things like word relationships, so how one word connects to another word. Or we might be thinking about words that help to connect different parts of a sentence, so words like conjunctions. So in typical development, when we think about this, uh, here's what happens when kids are typically developing throughout the school age years into adolescence. So they begin to use more of those words that are a part of the literate lexicon. Remember, the literate lexicon occurs when it's almost that bridge that's happening between oral language and written language, right? So it's that language that is really important for us to understand literate language, so words like interpret or predict. These can also be, these literate verbs can be words that we know are important for classroom success. So they could be, uh, as one of our students pointed out, the power words, right? So think about words like interpret and predict and how much bang for your buck you get um, with having knowledge about those kinds of words. So kids who are typically developing are able to apply those words across all kinds of different settings. Additionally, it's, we have those words that are the textbook terms, right? So the ones that we learn about that are related to the actual academic content that we're working on. We've also got these adverbs of magnitude, so words like slightly and unusually. You can see how those words are more complex than other kinds of words that we spoke about for preschool age children earlier. Adverbial conjuncts, so words like meanwhile, conversely, again, you can see how those words are more complex. Think about a word like therefore, for example, as well. Uh, we might have sarcasm that we use, and being able to tell when we're being serious with our words or not being serious with our words. The words that are used in slang terms. Everyone you know, in the class knows that I'm behind the times as far as slang terms. I'm just now picking up on what it means to be on fleek. And I know from you guys that that is something that is behind the times. Complex proverbs, metaphors, those aspects of figurative language, these are things that typically developing school-age children are picking up, right? And our students, the students who we work with who have language impairments, might struggle with all of these different aspects. Kids are also using, you know, ambiguous messages, uh, words that are more abstract. So think about trying to, how it is that we're going to teach a word like courage or justice. And certainly those, uh, the idioms, uh, the um, figurative language that we were speaking about before. And so 
here's what older kids should do, right? So they should be able to describe sensory experiences. They should be able to talk about location and time. I mean, these are things that should be more complicated. We talked about some of these things with preschool-aged language, but remember that words that kids are beginning to use in the school age years, and certainly as they make it through high school, become more and more complicated. Those relationship words, looking at relationships between words, so as big as, nearly, not quite. To be clear, when I say word relationships or semantic relationships later on, the types of words that I'm thinking about then are words that like antonyms and synonyms, so knowing how or how words can be categorized how different words can be um, related to one another. Additionally, you know, we might have different verbs, um, so more complicated verbs, not the easier verbs that we talked about before. Uh, and we could have words that help uh, us uh, express causation and motivation. You don't have to memorize all of these. What we're trying to do here is to paint a picture of what it is like for kids as they move through the school age years. In terms of language impairment, when we work on that, we know that the kiddos who we serve are going to have small vocabularies. What they're going to be doing is they're going to be relying on high frequency short words. This is why we're going to do things like look at lexical diversity, right? Um, and these are things that you should be noting in some of the videos that we've seen so far. So think about the fact that there might be an over-reliance on the same words over and over again. Uh, we also need to consider the Matthew effect, and so we've spent a lot of time talking about that. And so it could be that it's not just, again, how nothing happens in a vacuum, it's not just difficulties in semantics, but because there might be difficulties in reading, the children who we serve might not have um, exposure to these different types of words, right? And related to the point that we had about over-reliance on words, we might see many more examples of non-specific words simply because the students who we work with do not have the vocabulary to provide those more specific words. Additionally, uh, you know, there are those more complex semantics, so relational words, as I was describing before, children who have language impairments might have difficulty knowing things such as what words go together, or things like opposites, things like synonyms. Uh, we know that kids, another example of complex semantics, and you've probably seen this in your practicum site, is working on words that have multiple meanings, uh, and certainly more abstract words, so those words that we just spoke about in term, uh, like courage and justice. Many children with language impairment also have word-finding difficulties, so this is uh, something that we're going to speak about later in the lecture, but uh, some children, and this is a little bit difficult, might be able to understand what those words mean, but have difficulty retrieving those words. So that's a little bit different than when we think about a child who has difficulty both understanding and expressing those words. And certainly some of the things that we just spoke about in terms of what happens in typical development, children who have language impairment are going to struggle with. So things like figurative language. We've spoken about following complex directions and the types of words that are in complex directions. Remember, when we speak about complex directions, it's also about syntax. To produce a good narrative, you need to be able to have a good vocabulary. Think about all of the transition words. Think about the words that we use to express emotional states. Think about the words that we use that create story sparkle. And so to be able to do those things, you have to have a good vocabulary. And certainly, in being able to understand words and be able to write and speak about those words, you have to use certain words that connect information across different sections. Again, those are words like conjunctions.